pleasure to welcome um, Steve Arnold, who's it's a pretty good little introduction. His research covers so many bases of interest to us. It's a real exemplar of the sort of breadth um, that uh, we cover, and that uh, I guess our former students and we hope our former students will cover. Uh, Steve did his BA here um, at Berkeley, in, well, some years ago. I won't say how long ago, uh, and then went to a PhD at ANU. And I have a cheat sheet here which I've lost. Yeah, no, I'll uh, at Ann Arbor, that's right. Um, and then was a Miller postdoc with David um, from uh, 1971 to 73, before going to a sequence of spectacular positions. His research is really extraordinary. It covers um, fundamental theory of natural selection and sexual selection. He's done a lot of work on the evolution of the gene matrix, uh, genetic correlations, and how they constrain or direct the response to selection, uh, work on behavior. Um, evolution of behaviours in newts, snakes, all the population biology of snakes. It's a really diverse and fascinating program. Uh, today he's going to tell us about some of it, but not all of it. Um, and uh, inside of here, my pod, a window on the back of the ocean. Welcome, Steve. It's great to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get my analog pointer over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something. So you know what I think? I don't think we need to dim the lights. And what about the videographer? Is that working? Videographically, videographically working. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, in general, but also for your centennial celebration. Uh, and uh, you all look, I know you've got a packed sequence of activities for the centennial. I thought I'd just share an observation. I'm sure many of you have made this. There's one amongst you who, it seems to me, is converging on the Grinnell phenotype. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think probably you've noticed this, that he, he's either been trimming his beard or pulling it so it becomes more pointed. <laughs> I'm talking about Jim Patton. <laughs> and so, uh, thinking about this on the plane down, I'm not sure of the dates, but is it possible that he's the reincarnation? It's an interesting hypothesis to consider and perhaps test. All right, but today, uh, uh, so actually, and I realized too, as a, as a bridge to my talk, that I started the garter snake work, which will be the test case that we'll talk about today, while I was a postdoc here. And uh, again, Patton isn't here, so that's too bad. But I want to publicly apologize for, for what must have been a very odiferous research project. <laughs> because we were feeding frozen fish, and I think back, it must have been, it was in the bone room, or somewhere near the bone room, there, were, there was no window. No one ever complained about the odors, at least not to me. Maybe you ran interference from that. I'm all well reconstructing this. There must have been complaints. I never heard them. And, and I was completely oblivious at any rate. So this is the report on what, what we did with the garter sanction. All right, so this is a this is a paper that I did with postdoc Paul Hohenbaum. And the MyPlot stands for Microevolutionary Inference from Patterns of Divergence. And this is an article that came out uh, a month ago in American National, so you can see it there. But also there's software available, free of charge, online if you're, if you're interested in doing the sorts of stuff we're talking about here. So it's true that I've done a variety of things, but the interest that I've always had, uh, even as a little undergraduate, or even as a high school student, is in the evolution of characters. That's the thing that's, that's interested me. And so today is not about genomics. Today is about trying to understand the evolution of particular characters and, and dealing, grappling with the issue of we've got a phylogeny, how do we, how do we analyze character evolution using our phylogeny? So here's the outline. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is this sub-discipline known as comparative studies in which we're trying to look at character evolution on a 
in phylogeny, and I want to look at the past, present, and future, and my pod uh, is part of that. And the particular test case we're going to look at is the correlated evolution of garter snake vertebral members. And the big question is, what is causing that correlated pattern of evolution? And I think there are the ingredients that we need for a solution is not only the phylogeny <coughs> of the organisms in question, but also the gene matrices of the traits that we're looking at, estimates of population size and selection surfaces, and all of that's going to get defined as we go forward. The theory that we're going to use is the neutral theory for one or more traits, and we're not really testing this theory. And why is that? Because we know for these kinds of characters, we're going to be talking about continuously distributed characters affected by many genes. We know that, excuse me, depending on whether you're a QTL person, uh, we know that for these kinds of characters, the, the neutral theory is hopelessly correct. We know that on short time scales, the neutral theory predicts too little evolution, and on long time scales, it predicts too much. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you. So we're not here to beat the dead horse of neutrality. We're here to use it. And in particular, we're going to look at a hypothesis testing framework with our good friend maximum likelihood. And we're going to use that to see what my pod can tell us about adaptive radiation and snake vertebral numbers, and perhaps in general. And we'll, we'll end up with, with where we would like to go with my pod and my perspective or our perspective on this subdiscipline. Okay, so there's our roadmap. So, <laughs> A common problem when you pick up somebody else's theory is it doesn't do what you want it to do. And so what you need to do is get your mind right. Or as uh, Nick Jagger would say, you've got to be satisfied with what you get, which is going to be what you need. So let's see. So that, that is... So working with Paul on this, art, on this, on this project, and which turned into an article, I realized that this is the big problem with my body, is understanding what it does. It really is giving you what you need, but it's not the first thing you'd ask for. So you have to... <laughs> so that's what this talk is about. You could read the article, but to get into it, beware. You need to readjust your expectations. <clears throat> Okay, so comparative studies. Where are we now? So beginning, so I start the clock <laughs> with Felsenstein's paper in 1985. And basically the idea was, let's take a phylogeny, let's take some trait values, perhaps some indicator variables, and we'll use a neutral process model, and we'll make some predictions from, from that input. And the output that we'll get, whoops. Back up with what is the that must be the other such process. What you get then is a test for correlated evolution, or as you'd say, you 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 correct for the effects of phylogeny, you get rid of uh, of the co uh, the, the, the covariance due to co ancestry, and you, you test some hypothesis that has to do with correlated evolution. And you might also reconstruct ancestral trait values. So here's, here's our complaint. What we think is the field is basically stalled at this point since 1985. And so I think what we want to do is we want to, we want to get more. We want to get more out. And guess what? To get more out, we're going to have to put more in. And so here's what, so here's what, we're getting to what you what you what you need. Here's what you want. What you want is over there, but to get it, you're going to have to input something more: G matrices, maybe effects of population size, and maybe selection surfaces. And if you did, if with those additional inputs, you could get a lot of additional things out. And we're not seeing these outputs because we're not putting this in, and we don't have process models that get us in. <coughs> So in particular, we're going to talk about these in more detail. In particular, what we'd like is a reconstruction, I think, of the adaptive landscape and how it's producing the adaptive radiation we're looking at. And we'd also like to reconstruct ancestral trait values under something other than the neutral model. Okay, here's what, so here's, oops. Unbelievable, I have so much trouble with this. 
Okay, here's what my pipe does. It takes those inputs that we just talked about, and it, and it does these things. It gives, it gives us a test for correlated evolution that's taking account of the phylogeny. It's going to give us tests for the effects of diversifying and multivariate stabilizing selection. And it's going to test these two hypotheses about genetic and selective forms of least resistance. So those are things that we haven't been doing. And in particular, where it departs from the literature right now, it, it's going to do this in full multivariate mode. We're going to talk about two characters today, but this approach and the programs that we're advertising <laughs> work on multiple characters, as many as you want. And the big leap forward is that we're using the D matrix to, dis to incorporate estimates of genetic constraints for the characters. We're not ignoring this constraint. Uh, and we're thinking about a stochastic version of evolution, which depends on the population size. Okay, so here's the sort of pattern that we're, we're interested in. Um, so if we look at the next several slides, I should be labeled mean number of body burden, mean, mean number of tail vertebrae. And here we're looking at different geographic races and species of garter snakes. So these are, think of them as species means. And if we look at those means, we see some correlation in the characters. You know, it's just as a, as a des descriptive thing, looking at the tips of the tree, it's pretty, pretty clear that, that there's a, a correlation there. And if we wanted to just proceed on descriptive terms, we could do a, a principal confluence analysis. And our first PC would go like that, and our second would go like that. True? True or false? True. And here it is. There it is. First PC, second PC. This is actually just the 95% confidence ellipse fitted to those data. And we're going to use this format to describe to describe the data. We're going to use this format to put all of the multivariate kinds of data on the same format so we can so they can talk to each other to us and to one another to produce a theory. So this first PC is also known as the eigenvector for the matrix that lies behind this as another description. And we're going to call the first PC Dmax. And it represents the main axis of divergence, hence the D. So this is the direction in which there's, a, there's apparently been the most divergence in this pair of characters. Now, as a matter of fact, we know from, from Felsenstein's argument that we want to correct for the covariance coming from phylogeny. And, and so we need a more complicated analysis than the tip version. Uh, and we'll do that in the course of, course of our consideration. But this is what we want to understand is what is causing Emax and the cloud in general. And we've got a couple of outliers here that we're going to come back to later. Egregious outliers. <laughs> That'll be interesting to think about. Okay, so now, now let's back away from, from our plot and think about this adaptive landscape that I alluded to earlier. And what the adaptive landscape can do is give us a vision for understanding the process, all of the processes that could contribute to producing this picture of correlated evolution that, that we're looking at. So, for example, and of course there are many data sets like this, right? I forgot to mention, allometry. Correlated evolutions of all kinds typically have a bivariate pattern. It might be negative or might be pos positive in, in inclination, but the problem is still the same. Let's think of a particular population as being close to an adaptive peak. And these contours represent this adaptive landscape that we're thinking about. The contours, now we have a mean body, mean tail vertebrae. The contours represent mean population fitness as a function of mean number of body and tail vertebrae. And this local population we're imagining is close to its optimum. And the landscape that we're drawing is one in which there's bivariate stabilizing selection, and there's also correlational selection. <laughs> so, and what we're imagining then that is that a very simple selection surface, adaptive <laughs> landscape like this, might have been responsible for this, uh, this species evolution to this point from, say, the node, the ancestral population, which might be back here. So this population, via phylogeny, took some path through bivariate space to end up here. 
And what we're imagining is that it, that it was following this very simple adaptive peak, which moved for some ecological reason, perhaps, through bivariate space. Have you bought all of that? You're thinking about it. <coughs> not, not Richard Dawkins, what, Mount Improbable? Not a complicated adaptive landscape, a very simple one, whose peak moves through time. Let's make it very simple and imagine that the peak also, the landscape, keeps its same configuration even though the peak might move. So that if we now think about all the other populations, we might as well assume that they too are close to their adaptive peak. That's responsible for the stability that we observed if we watch them through time. And if we superimposed all of those adaptive peaks, we might get this mess. And, uh, and what, we, what we're seeing here is a particular hypothesis that, that, that says that each of these adaptive landscapes has a main axis, which is like a principal component. And we're going to call that omega max for the, for the main axis of the, of the adaptive landscape. And that corresponds, we can think of that, we're going to refer to that as a selective line of least resistance later on, because you can see that if the mean moves along this axis, there's not much change in fitness compared to movement this way. And furthermore, we're going to imagine that when, in general, what's happened then is that the, the general direction of movement, and I've contrived the figure so this is true, is along this axis W max, the big arrow. Differentiation, the driving of the adaptive radiation is a consequence of movement of peaks along an axis <laughs> that's omega max. Now here's, here's, let's come back to the expectation idea. What I'd love to present today would be a model, a software package that could reconstruct something like this from the input directly. Mm -hmm. What my thought is going to do is it's give, it'll give us indirect pictures that we can reconcile with this vision without producing this reconstruction directly. Remember, I, so this is a reconstruct, the kind of reconstruction I think we'd like, but I dropped it off my list of, of expectations. Are you readjusted? <laughs> yes, okay, good. So you're not going to get that. What, what are you going to get? No rolling stones. You're going to get what you need, <laughs> not what you want. That direction might correspond to some, some ecological variable or set of variables like vegetation density. There's some data that suggests that as we go up in that space, we're going towards populations and species that are inhabiting denser vegetation. And there's a premium on having more body and tail vertebrae to bridge between bush points and such a, a sparse, sorry, less vegetation in this direction. But here's where we're going to let Joseph Brunel down today. This is the last point which we're going to refer to ecology. Right? Again, we're readjusting your expectations. So there's that's another whole seminar. In fact, that's my thought too. So we're not going to talk about that. We're going to we're not going to deal with. We're going to diagnose selection from the things that it, from the effects that it, that it has in our, in our, in our my thought analysis, but we're not going to identify the actual agents of that selection. Okay, so here are input ingredients, uh, phylogeny, uh, some trait counts, and then we're going to talk about these two matrices to find them, uh, estimates of effective population size and some selection services that will tell us about and make a or at least give us some thoughts about omega max. Who's phylogeny? De Kuros et al. It's based on uh, mitochondrial genes. It's pretty well resolved, and I haven't put the bootstrap values on here. One of the things we're going to take away, in addition to the, the branching patterns and branch lengths, is a calibration, which tells us, using the standard mitochondrial clock, that the root of the tree here is about is back there about four and a half million years ago. About a hundred and how many generations is that? We're assuming five years per, per generation, so you can do the division. But the point is, this radiation of uh, in excess of 30 populations and geographic races and species is a Pliocene through Pleistocene time scale. And we need that time scale. And then here are little cartoons showing you the, the average numbers of body and tail vertebrates, vertebrates or the taxa that were considered here. And these were taken from museum specimens specimens 
from people in this room like the change in the Do you remember? Okay, so let's go to our first ingredient. The first ingredient we want to talk to about are, are these G matrices. And what are they? Okay, now I've changed axes. These literally are the number of body vertebrae, not the mean. The number of tail vertebrae, not the mean. I mentioned <laughs> one of those points in the plot before. Let's say this is the average for some populations or species. We go into a particular population, and what we're going to imagine is that there's a cloud of genetic values, not just phenotypic values. These are genetic values that we have to we have to deduce by doing a breeding design. And in fact, what we've done with the Gardner Saint is look at mother-daughter relationships. Did I tell you that all of these data are for females? That's okay. And so we can actually reconstruct this cloud of, of genetic values. The variation in this axis tells us that there's abundant genetic variation in body vertebrae. Here's the genetic variation in evidence for genetic variation in tail vertebrae. And then there's a genetic covariance between the, between the two traits. And a G matrix describes as three elements, the, the two variances and the, the covariance in the off-diagonal little two by two table. There's another way to think about the G matrix, and that's to think of it in terms of this little 95% confidence ellipse, right? Because we could draw a standard 95% confidence ellipse with our favorite package, and it would look like this. And here it is here. Okay, so this is then our representation of the G matrix, and it has, it has length and it has width. In fact, it's going to be convenient to refer to its principal components. And we're going to even give them a name. I meant to put it on. Well, we're going to call this main axis, what would you call it? My notational consistency. Let's see if you're awake. We should call it G-max, right? Because it's the direction of greatest genetic variation in the population. And that is what we're going to call it. OK. So here's the point. I can just put my hands on push it on, but we have multiple estimates of the G matrix after this G max, and here they are. And in our analyses, we found that these matrices aren't identical, but they do have a principal component, the first principal component in common. We can't reject that they look like they're tilted, but not enough so that we can reject the hypothesis that they have different G maxes. Okay. So that's, that's one ingredient. Here's another ingredient. Oh, well, let's go to Schluter's conjecture. Strange that I would forget. Schluter's proposed that during adaptive radiations, the direction of D max should coincide with G max. That it's, it's essentially what he's saying is that G essentially is driving the adaptive radiation. And what I don't like about it is we don't refer to the adaptive landscape at all. Still, it's a conjecture that we can test. Is this, is this the direction of D max for the radiation? Guess what? Why am I grinning so broadly? <laughs> it's not. Because it's not. All right. And then Manny and Arnold have done a, some of you remember Molly, who was a student here, did a study of microsatellite variation in two species at Eagle Lake. And averaging across population, this is output from, from Burley and Felsenstein's program, Migrate, the diameter of the circles is proportional to effective population size. If you average across the, this middle population in two species, a, a, a good number for effective population size to use coming away from this experience would be 500. So they'll use that. If only they were an analog advancement device. Okay, here's the last ingredient. We have also have some glimpses of the adaptive landscape by doing studies of selection within population. And these are, these are, this isn't total fitness, but it gives us some ideas about what the adaptive landscape might look like. So for example, if we do a, field, a study of growth rate in the field of Thanophis elegans at Eagle Lake, which we were just looking at, uh, and then look at growth rate in the field as a function of the body vertebrae, which after all have changed during life in these snakes. Fit a, fit a surface, we find that there is 
There's actually, although it's hard to see here, there's actually stabilizing selection on both traits, a little more obvious on the tail than on the body. But the interesting feature is that there's strong correlational selection, which would promote a covariance between the two characters. And if we fit a main axis up that surface, then we, the selective line of least resistance is here, omega max, with that kind of an angle. So that's interesting to think about. We're going to come back to this later because what this is saying is that, that you can have you can be a snake with any combination of vertebrae in your body and tail along this line and you have equivalent fitness. The population mean lies right here. So it's thinking about surfaces like this that make me argue that we could be we should be able to extrapolate the surface. If you if you evolve the mean, I can imagine that you that you well, evolution along this selective line of least resistance is biomechanically the best way to go, not opposed by selection. You're opposed if you go off of that best combination. Put that up for a minute. Have water. Okay. Here's another surface from a study that Al Bennett and I did of crawling performance in a related species, Stanopus radix. These are newborn snakes of both sexes. And what you see there is a population mean that sits right here on this sort of strange saddle. There's only one feature of this surface that's statistically significant, and that's this picture of correlational selection that it shares with the other surface, and that defines a, a second selective line of least resistance. From the standpoint of crawling, this is the best combination to have, and you actually do better up here than down here, but the curvature is really pretty slight, but it's especially bad to fall off the line in, in those two directions. All right, I think that's our last ingredient. And now we want to turn to the model we're going to use. All right, and this is where we're going to use effective population size. So this is a this is a model in Delandia, 1976, and there are other people who produced before and after similar models with continuous traits. And the thing that the neutral model does when we look at a single trait is that it specifies a, a, a distribution of trait means. So here's our, here's our thought experiment. Imagine at time zero, we create a series of replicate populations with the same number of body vertebrae. They all have the same heritability for the trait. They all have the same effective population size. And we let those populations change through time. We have powerful theory that will tell us after a hundred generations, we can specify what that distribution, the distributions of the means of those replicates is. And our theory tells us that the distribution is normal and that it has a variance that's proportional to elapsed time and to genetic variance and inversely proportional to affected population size. So as time goes forward, I should have had brought this simulation, right? As time goes on, well, here it is the distribution spreads out like this, 200 generations, 1,000, 5,000, 20,000. The difference, so this is a distribution of means of, across the replicates. When we pick up a population, it is, according to the neutral theory, a sample from this distribution. Are you happy? I see so many frowns here today. <laughs> Come on, you're happy. Because now we want to go to two traits. Are you ready? <laughs> Finally, we get back in our familiar ellipse mode. So what happens in two dimensions is we start with something exactly like the G matrix, and as time goes on, the dispersion of population means among the replicates is a blown up version of the G matrix, for reasons we're not going to go into. So here's the beauty. Here's, and here's the foundation upon which my pod rests. The neutral theory is telling us that the differentiation we observe is just a blown up, should be just a blown up version of the G matrix if there's bivariate neutral evolution of the traits we're looking at. And the set of populations that we looked at early on is a sample from that bivariate normal distribution. Okay. 
Actually, let's mention here too that we're going to concentrate on three things. We'll see this in the slide coming up. The size of this matrix, which is of this cloud, which is like the sum of that distance and this distance, or those two variances. The shape, is it a football or a cigar? And its orientation, but it's tilted. And what we're saying is the neutral theory says the cloud of divergent points on a star phylogeny population should be a blown up version of the G matrix with the same and expanded size, but the same shape and the, and the same orientation. <clears throat> All right, so those of you who like equation format, here we see just what we've been talking about. If the single <coughs> trait with replicate lineages on a star phylogeny, the variance among the population means is, is directly proportional to the genetic variance of lap time, inversely proportional to effective population size. Oh, that makes huge sense to all of us. If we have multiple traits, replicate lineages on a star phylogeny, then we have two matrices here. Right, so this is a this is a variance covariance matrix for the means, and this is the G matrix that we looked at earlier. It's total two by two. If we have traits on an actual phylogeny, not a star phylogeny, we can use a trick uh, that I attribute to, we attribute to uh, Amelia Martins and Tom Hansen, which is to replace time with a matrix that gives us the branch lengths on the from the phylogeny in units of number of generations. All right. This is what we need. Because what we're saying, according to the neutral model, is that the means are normally distributed with a particular mean and a variance covariance matrix given by that thing A that we just talked about. And here's our old print. This is the multivariate normal distribution, saying that the probability of the data, this eta is there, what is that? Zeta? No, it's zeta? Psi. Yes, in fact, I looked up this one. I knew I could count it. Your Greek, your knowledge of Greek is extensive, isn't it? <laughs> but it's restricted to the alphabet. <laughs> okay, so here's our expression for a multivariate normal distribution. And what we're saying is the probability of observing the data is a function of this parameter A. And if we substitute back in what we just had, here's G, right? So it's saying that that the probability of observing the data is a function of some things that we take from other studies like the phylogeny and effective population size, but it's a function of this matrix G. Okay, so using this probability, we can immediately write a likelihood uh, expression, we just need to take a log, and using that expression, we can, we're set up to do hypothesis tests. Now, here's what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at three aspects of G, and we're going to do comparisons between G and the divergence data, and we're going to ask about size, shape, and orientation. So let's, let's think about what that means. We're going to ask whether the divergence we observe is less than the observance we, divergence we predict from, from the G matrix. We're going to fit this value for maximum likelihood, and then we're going to compare that to our direct observations of G. Secondly, we're going to ask whether oops, sorry, whether there's a difference in shape. We're going to fit a G matrix by maximum likelihood and compare that to the real matrix. It might differ in shape. It might also differ in orientation. And those differences between what we observe and what we predict are going to tell us three different things about the adaptive radiation that the adaptive landscape that's driving our, our differentiation, our, our adaptive radiation. Okay, so here's the here's what the output looks like. Here's this you may you may or may not like this format. So this is this is the table that you put in your article. Ours is stuck in an appendix. And here's what's happening basically. Here are the size, shape, and orientation parameters for the average G matrix that we used from, from elegant populations. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to fit the shape parameter, size parameter by maximum likelihood, 
fixing shape and orientation at the observed values, right? And then we're going to compare the likelihood of observing the data here with the likelihood of observing the data here when we fit a new size. Right? And you can see the size is vastly smaller than what we observed. And that's a significant difference. We have a significant improvement in the likelihood of observing the data when we when we fit the size. In fact, this is the biggest message of all, is there's a huge discrepancy in size. Like we can do this stepwise and add in shape and then finally add in orientation stepwise. So we have three different tests in our likelihood framework for those different aspects of discrepancy from the neutral model. Now, what do they look like graphically? Because I like graphs. The first thing we observe is that we observe much less divergence than we expect. This radiation would be neutral. It should be, the cloud should be 30 times bigger than it is. So the implication then is that there's some force that's restraining the divergence. And it can't be a genetic constraint because we've taken that into account. There's something else that's retarding, restraining the divergence of the body and tail vertebrae across the genes. And this is a hugely significant uh, result. And in fact, it's exactly what we expected, because remember I told you, on long time scales, we almost always reject mutuality for this reason, too little divergence on long time scales. The shape is wrong, too. Divergence is more elliptical than what we expect from the neutral model in blue. We get more differentiation in this axis and less in that axis, which is actually reminiscent of the selection surfaces we were looking at, right? So, this is so one implication is there's some restraining forces acting much more powerfully in this direction than in that direction. It might be stabilizing the correlation selection or something like that. And then finally, here's here's an interesting thing. If we look at the orientation. Uh, uh, the, the actual orientation is less than what we expect from neutrality based on just the G matrix. So this is this is the disappointing news for Schluter. D max is different from G max, and it's the inclination is less. So the question is, let's see how let's see if you've been paying attention. If D max is not G max, what do we want to compare it with? A max? This is at the start of the talk. We're running out of time. Remember omega max? Omega max, that's what we want to compare it with. And in fact, D max matches up nicely with the growth axis, but it doesn't match with the with the crawling speed axis. But this is a very interesting result, that, that we cannot reject the hypothesis that, that the, the main angle direction of differentiation coincides to the principal axis of one of our selection circuits. And that, the implication there is that adaptive peaks are moving along the direction of omega mass. And that was sort of our most provocative assumption. So it's nice to see that testing. And here's what we're saying. That what that would mean is that peaks are pre predominantly sliding along this axis during differentiation. You're, you, you get into a, a, an environment with less vegetation, but the whole, uh, there's a slight optimum here, slightly curved. That optimum shifts up in this direction along the angle that we're showing this omega max. Let's speed up just a little bit. We're almost done now. Okay, so how, re how robust are the results? Well, we can use different values of G for both elegance and certalis, and if you do that, you basically get the same results. Uh, the only thing that changes is sometimes that shape test doesn't come out significant, but the orientation and the size test always come out significant. So that's good. That That's a vote for robusticity. Um, if you don't have a G matrix, you might consider using the within population phenotypic, phenotypic variance covariance matrix. You get that from just measuring individuals within a population and getting their 
variances and covariances for your trees. That matrix gives exactly the same result as the G matrix in, in this exercise. So the traffic might allow that substitution in the future. This actually, I like, is a, it's a test of what used to be called the Kluge curve foot phenomenon. Um, Those two outliers, the one at the top was Cerritos, and the one just below it was Proximus. Those are the two most arboreal garter snakes, and that's probably why they have disproportionately long tails. If we drop them out and redo the analysis, we get the same conclusions. So they're not really distorting anything. And then finally, you might worry about our calibration, but the point is we have to be off 36-fold to change our, our, our conclusions. So we might be off, it could be off, be off 30, 36 fold in our calibration of time on our biological I, I wouldn't think it'd be off that far. Okay, so here's the, here's the vision, coming back to the vision. One thing we did find was we've only got a couple of, of glimpses of the adaptive landscape, uh, but they suggest that there's a, some kind of a, a line like this, and indeed, in one case, one of these lines, differentiation is in that direction. So that gives us some confidence that there might be might be some uh, validity to this view of adaptive landscapes, of uh, uh, adaptive radiations. But, and we have some confirmation that, that in fact there is, there is an active force. I think of this as something like Simpson's adaptive zone. There's a boundary to the zone that might be, that it apparently comes into play out here. It might be stabilizing selection or something else, but something's canalizing pushing the radiation towards this red arrow direction. That was confirmed by the analysis, by the shape result. Okay, so here are our general conclusions. And this is, this is the inverse of something Monty Slatkin told me year, years ago, garbage in, garbage out. To put it positively, the more you put in, the more you're gonna get out. <laughs> so that's not too big of a surprise. So the big puzzle has always been, how, how can we fold in things from population biology and quantitative genetics like the G matrix effect of population size selection surfaces, how can we fold those into comparative studies? And what we've seen today that is it, it, that my thought's one way to fold them in, we, we get more out than we're used to getting. Um, and in particular, we can visualize the adaptive landscape and the role that it might play in adaptive uh, radiations, but what we really want is something that explicitly reconstructs the adaptive landscape and the movement of the peaks, and we don't have that yet. That's that's what we can work on. But I think the framework that we're, we've been playing with, we've been using, we've been, we've been laboring with, uh, will permit that. And then finally, we have this empirical issue that we really don't have much data on how homogeneous adaptive landscapes and selection surfaces are among taxa, and that's sort of a big leap of faith in the current instar of this approach. Okay, we're almost out of time, but here, there are a lot of people that have uh, worked with the garter snake, uh, collaborated on the garter snake study over the years. These are the people who kicked in after we, we I stopped working on slug eating, remember the slug eating thing? Swabs and all that. Uh, <laughs> after, after the swab period, then we started counting vertebrae. And these are all of the people who have been involved over the years with uh, with the garter snakes directly or with the ideas that we've been using to think about the garter snake data. Uh, right up to, from this person who some of you know to this person who you don't know probably, who's a, a student now at the graduate program at the Okay. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few minutes for questions. So, going back to 1988, so um, on the study. Oh, that the, selection surface thing. Yeah. And you said yeah. that one didn't really, wasn't very explanatory. I did. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the current one? The sprint scheme. Yeah. Um, so, and that was done in box, right? Are you but bothered so, that, because I chose the one that gave the right answer? No, no. <laughs> no, no, no I didn't. I mean, the sprint scheme one didn't. So, the field estimate of the thickness surface was predicted, but the script speed one wasn't. Yeah. And that was done in the box, right? Yeah. And so I'm just wondering what, 
I'm glad you made that argument. I'm just wondering what that selective sample would look like. Yeah. And how much it would change. I mean, you're pointing out that you know that there's weather would change in the direction um, from the uh, sparse vegetation down to the dense vegetation. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's what I. That's what I take away from this too. It makes me want to. I would like to do more performance testing like that to see if we could understand what this boundary on the adapted zone is all about. Is, is that the explanation for why you don't have combinations of vertebrae if that's, you know, like, maybe the ribbon snakes are really miserable at crawling through vegetation and that they've got these ridiculous tails to help refining the vertebrae. So that's another thing this does for us, I think, is it, it makes you go back and gives you specific things that you can test through the with uh, various approaches. So how do you know, how do you infer that the directionality of selection is up and to the right on that graph and not down and to the left? Is that a phylogenetic interpretation? You know, you're right. Do you like it down and to the left? Sure. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. It should have been a double-headed arrow. It should have been a double-headed arrow. Good point. It was a white. Although he wasn't uh, acknowledged. <laughs> 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 yeah, Hobart Smith's not up there either. <laughs> so, yeah. But there, you are acknowledged in the paper in the appendix. <laughs> 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 and one of these caps too. See, I'm wondering about applying this to, to populations within species, and you've got, as I understand it, a mix there of data of you've got among species and among yeah. populations within species. The effects of migration, whether it's sort of the branch length on, say, population phylogeny, is they might really capture the constraining effects of the gene flow. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, think it, I think it could work. Um, You know, in a, in a phylogeography framework, if you can if you can build a phylogeny, you should be able to you know, apply the system. Uh, if you're really that serious about migration affecting the configuration of populations, I suppose you could try and input you know a reticulate network, you know, a network rather than a tree that really reflects core ancestry as well as migration. I mean, we haven't tried to do that. But I think you can do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How sensitive does the model to reflect the population size? What do you do if you don't have a good measure? You know, pretty insensitive. So remember that, so so just as time could be distorted by a, a factor of 36, so, so, so could affected population size. So uh, decide, you know, that first test, <laughs> there's just no way that goes away. The fact that this, this radiation is... I won't try and toggle back, will I? No. No, I won't. <laughs> this radiation is, 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 <laughs> this radiation is so... You can see it in the diagram. Remember when I showed the phylogeny and there were all the cartoons? Now, if you look back at the cartoons, you notice how uniform they are. In, they should, there should be or, more than an order of magnitude, more variation in body and Vertebrae, if, if this were a neutral radiation. So there is diversification going on, which is giving us an interesting bedding. But the big message is that it's so constrained, and it's constrained in this particular funny way. So I think um, the, yeah, the, 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 you know, the, the radiation should be about that size. It should, sorry, it should be about this size, and it's actually that size. Now, what my pot is telling you is that. What we've got, what we've had at this point in just univariate analyses and telling this character is much less. Mm -hmm. But what my pod does, it says, tells you about the cloud, not just not just the the, the dimensions of the cloud, but actually its shape and its orientation. Um, and that's telling us, I think, not everything we want to know about what causes it, what's driving adaptive variations, but a lot more than than the univariate pictures we've had so far. Yeah. So is it a any more about ribbon snakes. I mean, are they filling a fundamentally different niche than the other garter snakes? And do you think that 
your you know, the, the result you have here shows that there's been sort of a frame shift in terms of their morphology and the niche they're filling, and that's why they're not evolving on the same axis to be able to find a Do you really do see them up in the vegetation more than, than other garter snakes? I mean, you, you know, a lot of terrestrial garter snakes. They're fast, too. They're slender and fast. I don't, I, don't, I don't think anybody's really done performance testing with them. I mean, Proximus, I haven't had as much experience with Proximus. Proximus is pretty terrestrial. I mean, I think yeah. it's... So, and it's not as extreme as Cerebus, which is the most extreme point. So one of the things we can do is, just since this is my pot too, is we can we classify these species and, and races by, by adaptive zone, terrestrial, aquatic, and arboreal. Uh, sorry, aquatic, terrestrial, and riparian. And when you do that, and, and then Cerebus and, and, and Proximus would be in the riparian group, then the, the orientation of their radiation is tilted way up like this, whereas the aquatic and the terrestrial ones, you get the same same results going through the whole thing. Size too, too little, shape more or less okay, but orientation different. And you get aquatic and terrestrial like this, and then the riparian ones are off in a different line like that. And that suggests that if we did performance testing, again, that, when, that should show up. When you're saying those axes, which axes? The, the Selection axes or the axis So, if you go to the go to the next slide here. <coughs> if I can just pause for a second, I know some people think they need to run the classes. So, those who have to go, go. Those who stick around and ask more questions, please do. Again, thank you very much, Steve. And then we'll go to the right now. And then another one? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more. So, so here, this is, this is, this is, this is Dmax for the whole group. That's all the population. This is all of the populations. But if you do it separately for the thinking of snakes in three adaptive zones, then you get two sets of species that have a lower orientation like this. Those are the aquatic and the terrestrial ones, which have exactly the same angle of diversification of Dmax. Uh, but if you look at the riparian species, they're actually tilted up like this, with a different different angle. How many qualify as riparian? How many species? No, those two. Just well, those no, two. no, more than those two. A lot of garter snake, snakes, Equus, Sertalis, Rhesusephalus. We think a lot of a lot of there's a big riparian radiation. So then those D maxes don't follow the the axis of the, what is it, the omega. They don't. No. And we haven't done that yet to see whether those, which if any of those three, coincide now with. They're certainly not going to. They're not going to coincide with with the crawling omega max. Is a way of like maybe 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 that's what the riparian guys are responding to. That, that might be. But but this one, which match, matches up nicely with the omega max for growth, the D max for the other two, we need. When you pull out the riparian guys, it's actually lower, so we may, we, it may not match up. Okay, well, thanks. All other questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Steve. <laughs>